Okay, I'm doing it. So yeah, until everybody's joining, um, yeah, please, you can start. So let me do an introduction. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'll, I should do myself or you do do that. I can do that. It's okay. Okay, cool. You can do that. Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Our um, bi-weekly talk is back again. So today uh, we'll have a talk. Um, with uh, G Chow Lin. She is a senior machine learning software engineer based in London, UK. Currently, she's a machine learning engineer at Facebook London office. Before she joined Facebook, she was the go-to person in satellite imagery applications at Adam and TI. During her time there, she worked on various satellite image projects and has rich experience and broad knowledge um, in the field. Before she moved to the UK, she studied and then lived um, in Germany for almost eight years. Originally, she came from China. Now she's also mother of um, a four-month um, old baby. Congratulations, by the way. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. You I want to start your talk. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I want to thank my family to give me uh, the opportunity to prepare this talk uh, because uh, taking care of a baby is very uh, stressful, stressful time for me. Okay, we'll shout out them then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the the topic of this talk is about satellite imagery AI, AI applications. And I will go through the data and data processing, data access, and some popular cloud platforms that is available there. And rest of the talk, I will go through an example of project that I have done last year. So I can skip this slide because Israel has already introduced myself. So satellite imagery has been used by scientists and researchers for decades, and it has been used to detect and track what happens on Earth. So you can, uh, you can think about all kinds of applications that are listed here, like ship detection, road mapping, uh, building segmentation, or tracking white animals and counting uh, like albatross on Antarctica areas. So um, with the power of AI, um, a lot of applications, like traditional applications, can be scaled up. So recently, I've seen uh, um, applications like Map with AI, which is a project from Facebook, and it has been go to production which means you can uh, try to generate the map from satellite imagery or help the OpenStreetMap labelers to, uh, to find the roads uh, quicker and to annotate the maps quicker. And other applications is pure scientific, like tracking cattle in rainforest in, in South America, try to help the deforestation, uh, things like that. So those applications are purely uh, scientific and nature science, like nature focused. And also there are some satellites which are launched for uh, monitoring the atmosphere. So those, those data can be used to track the climate change and to monitor the, the for example, the, uh, um, the leakage of uh, CH4 gas. And there's also studies to, uh, for flood detection and disaster response. But these applications, I will say, is barely used uh, widely in the, in the large scale applications. It, st it stays in the, in the research field. And when I tried to search a proper picture for this slide, I came across a blog on Medium. And I really agree with this picture. And I think you guys might see similar pictures on social media. And I think the satellite imagery applications um, um, probably go through, will follow totally this rule. And I will say people see the top, on the top, the fancy AI applications, but the real chunk of work is the software development underneath. This includes data engineering, infrastructure, labeling, visualization, and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, satellite imagery applications, uh, from my own experience, relies even more on software development because the data processing steps, uh, there's a lot of uh, techniques that you need to know besides the computer vision knowledge. And this is one of the biggest barrier when you work on satellite imagery. So another one is the resolution. So what I mean by resolution is the spatial and temporal resolution. So there's a trade-off there. There are satellites that visit the, the globe frequently like the Sentinel-2 from European Space Agency. This satellite will visit the same location on Earth almost every six days, but the spatial resolution is very low, meaning that the model will not perform if you use uh, the relatively low spatial resolution imagery. 
Um, and the very high resolution satellite, on the other hand, uh, they will visit the same location much less frequent, but your model will perform better. Uh, so another limitation of the very high resolution satellite uh, is that normally those satellites focus on uh, the developed countries and where the population is very dense. So for example, if you want to, uh, want to work on a project that focus on Sudan or Ethiopia, those satellites may, may give you very less data. And another barrier is cost of data. Since the very high resolution imagery um, will give you a better performance and people try to use them to boost their models uh, performance, but those images are very expensive. So let's say if you want to monitor a country like Ethiopia, the single snapshot will cost you millions of dollars, uh, not even mentioning that monitoring the country over time. So normally the researchers are only funded for doing their research. And in this phase, training a model and a proof of concept will, will um, like you need, to, you need to download only a small amount of data. And for this phase, normally it's affordable, but if you want to uh, transfer the model or machine learning into a, per, an, into a product, which means you need to uh, constantly improve the model and use the freshly ingested image to, to do the inference. That will make your project uh, unsustainable. So how to access the data? And I like to compare the data access, uh, different options with choosing a different class when you book a flight. So the most comfortable and convenient way, which is the first class, is to use the open data set that is already there. So for example, SpaceNet data set, which is open, and it contains very high resolution satellite imagery from uh, Maxa or Digital Globe, since Digital Globe has been uh, acquired by Maxa like two years ago. And with those data, you can also have very high quality labels and with rich mapping features such as building footprints or road networks that is already available for machine learning. Uh, but the open data set, um, with open data set, you cannot always find, uh, find the suitable ones for your own problem. For example, you want to count cattle in a rainforest, and you probably will not find an open data set for this problem. So in this case, you need to create your own data set and label them by your own. So again, uh, you have two probab possibilities. The first one is the business class, which is you pay uh, the commercial data platforms, you subscribe one, and uh, those platforms will give you very easy image access. And normally the data processing has been already down on the platform. So there's little efforts there, but you still need to label them. And if your budget does not allow, then you need, uh, you need to do everything from scratch, which is also possible, but uh, it takes quite a big, big chunk of work to do that. So you can use open source libraries and free APIs that is available there. And so what you need to know is those techniques, how to process satellite image, and of course, label them afterwards. And in this slide, I listed some of the satellite imagery platform uh, in a table. And I think this list is not an exhaustive list because I'm pretty sure there are some providers like uh, uh, USGS, I think US Geographical Survey, they provide also free data set. It's just uh, the platforms that I know and I have experience with. So I think one of the most popular one is the uh, Sentinels from European Space Agency or ESA. Um, the Sentinel-2 particular is very popular since it is the highest resolution uh, it's, it has the highest resolution among the free data that you can get. So other than Sentinel-2, you can see applications based on Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-5P occasionally based on the application itself. So Sentinel-1 is not an optical image, but it gives you a radar image or synthetic adventure radar. So you, sometimes you see SAR, S-A-R, so you will know that it is not optical image. And the advantage of using in the SAR image it, that it captures locations without worrying about the cloud because the, um, the electric mag magnetic electric will go through the cloud. But normally those resolution is much lower compared to the optical one. And Sentinel-5P 
uh, is a satellite that is launched to monitor the atmosphere. So you will see a lot of climate change applications using those data. And ESA has a open, uh, open access hub available there called Kupernikos Open Access Hub. Um, it offers the free APIs to query and download images. So this hub is a web, uh, web UI that you can, uh, you can search one or two images uh, based on the locations and your criteria. And it's very handy if you want to visualize an image and its footprints on the map. But if you want to uh, perform query and download um, images in batch and programmatically, you probably will not go through the open access hub. But instead, you will use the open source libraries like Sentinel Set or Sentinel, Sentinel Hub. And Sentinel Hub, as far as I know, so it has free APIs and it has also commercial APIs. And the functions is slightly different. And Sentinel Set, on the other hand, is full open source. And the set, uh, the set Sentinel 2 images is also hosted on uh, AWS S3 as well as um, Google Cloud. So those downloadings are totally free. Another platform which is, which is recently launched by ESA, I think last year, maybe year before, is called Eurodata Cube. And this is a commercial platform. And on this platform, user can access the data directly on a JuPyter notebook. And the image you download is already, um, already processed and it's ready for machine learning models. So there's not too much post-processing efforts there. And Sentinel Hub API is also available on the Eurodata Cube. So later on, I will go through an example project, and this project is based on EDC. So there are also there are also images from WorldView and GUI. So these two satellites are from Maxa. So actually, they are not two satellites, but the, for example, WorldView you have WorldView one, two, three, with different resolutions and different purposes. So what, what view three has the highest, uh, highest spatial resolution among all the commercial satellites with 0 0.3 meters per pixel. And GDBX platform is, the cloud, is a cloud platform corresponding. And it's also the first commercial product, uh, as far as I know, um, among all the commercial satellite providers. So I, Pretty, I'm pretty sure there are satellite, uh, other satellite providers like Airbus and Planet, they have similar data access platforms, but I personally have no uh, experience of, of them. So I didn't put anything here. So no matter how you choose to process your data, there will be some technical issues um, that you will face. So I illustrated some of the issues, the common issues in a satellite image. So this is the Sentinel-2 image and its footprint on the map. As you can see, some of the land is covered by cloud, which is the white, the white area. And, um, and also you, you realize that the footprint of this picture is actually not a rectangle. So, Normally the cloud coverage will be given in satellite image metadata. So when you search for an image, you can see like uh, how many, how many, uh, like how many percent of the land is covered by, by cloud. But this is only an indicator uh, of how many percent of the area is covered. So for example, your areas of interest is in location one and the API returns you that the whole image has only 10% cloud coverage. And you cannot tell that which 10% of the image is covered by cloud. So it might be that exactly this location you're interested in is covered by cloud. So in this case, your image will become noisy and sometimes completely useless. So if you use the open source libraries to query and download image, you will get a much larger image compared to your AIO, such as location two and five. So for location two, you just need to crop the original image using uh, utility tools. And this can be done programmatically. For location five, however, uh, it, it becomes tricky because partially it's blank and you don't really have to, you don't really want to have too much of the blankness um, because if the blank is too much, it just adds useless data to your data set. Um, in the next slide, I will talk about how to select the useful image out of, uh, out of it. So you might wonder why we want to utilize every pixel that is available there. 
why don't we just discard location five and images that is totally cloud free? And will that be uh, easier to and uh, to bring to bring uh, to uh, to make our life easier? So the answer is yes no, no, no. and also no. Is there any questions? I hear yeah. someone talking. Okay, I, I will go on. So yes, it will make the image processing steps easier and it will give us very little image after you just cutting so many pixels. Especially uh, at some AIOs, remember that the satellite will revi revisit only uh, like once a year or every six months. So in that case, we want to utilize every pixel that is available there. So the next slide, I will talk about the emptiness in the satellite image. So for example, we have an image that overlaps with your areas of interest, but partially is empty. And how, how you do that, you will divide the image into training data size, like a grid, and you calculate the channel entropy of each image. Then you could filter the image with low entropy by setting a threshold. So this picture was taken from uh, a project I've done in, at LMAA. So if you're interested in that project, there's a link below. You can follow that uh, and have a look. So you might also ask why we don't simply filter images that is all zero or have the same value for all pixels. So the fact is, the fact that it, is that the value for emptiness for different satellite is not necessarily zero. And sometimes it has slightly slightly above zero and below zero. So the, the, there's some variance. Therefore, you cannot just filter uh, image that has constant value in it. So I think channel entropy is a very fast and efficient way and can be applied to different satellite images at, uh, at the same time. So it's a uniform operator. Um, so sometimes you may also keep the image that is only like, let's say 20% empty because uh, you want to save the pixels that is available there. So let's say uh, for images here, there's a little, little emptiness in it and you still want to use it. But the image above like this, uh, probably you will not, and you will probably discard it. So you can set the threshold and try to control the emptiness in your data set. And the rest of the talk, I will go through an example project that I have done last year. So last year was a special year, I think for everybody, uh, also for you guys in Sofia. Uh, however, I'm not sure uh, how the situation will be like, it was like last year for you guys. So in, uh, in the spring, the Europe went, to, went into lockdown because of the pandemic. And ESA has launched a contest to encourage the geo uh, enthusiasts to develop their own solutions to observe and compare the activities before, during and after the pandemic using satellite imagery. So this is a kind of a response from ESA side to the pandemic. And together with Michael, a former colleague of mine at Element AI, we worked on the context and at the end we won the third prize. So we are quite happy about the result afterwards. And the contest itself was launched uh, in April, 2020. It has two phases. Uh, the participant needs to choose a topic uh, in the first phase to, to work on. So topics like traffic uh, in a highway, airport, or any water body pollutions or traffic on the ocean, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's fully uh, open to everybody. And in the, after the first phase, uh, the ESA will announce the winner from all solutions they received every month. So in total, there are six winners from the phase one and they will be invited to the next phase where, where they need to prove that the solutions is upscalable to the whole EU. Uh, the, the solution itself is not restricted to EU. It can be applied everywhere, but it's just because of the stakeholder and the sponsors are ESA. So that's why uh, they try to focus on the EU. And the first prize winner out of the out of two phase will be invited to integrate their solution on a dashboard launched by ESA called a Rapid Action Coronavirus Observation Dashboard or RACE. So you will see RACE is a dashboard uh, to show the indicators like uh, water pollution or traffic. 
And also there's an interactive map uh, for data analysis. The participant will be provided by, uh, by ESA, the Euro, Euro, data set, uh, Euro Data Cube, which is a new plat platform from ESA. And on it, you will have uh, access to Sentinel Hub API. And so as a data scientist, normally used to work on Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook. So uh, this platform allows you to, uh, to, you, to work on the, the, the Jupyter Lab, um, which is a quite familiar environment for uh, machine learning, uh, machine learner nowadays. Uh, so here is a screenshot of the, dash of the dashboard, and I paste the link also. So if you're interested, you can see. And I think the 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 rapid the race dashboard is still on, and ESA is still working on it. So there are so many topics. Why we choose to work on the ocean? I think Michael and I was inspired by the UN decades on ocean science for sustainable development which starts uh, from, from this year to 2030. And Michael and I also have some previous works existing in the ocean direction. And I think that's why we choose to work on the ocean. And the other topics like air traffic, highway traffic, we think it's not necessarily uh, using satellite imagery. And so why we monitor the ship's traffic at all. Uh, this is because quantifying ship's traffic is a very key uh, value for economy intelligence. And it's a very important indicator to uh, monitor the economic activities in the EU. Therefore, we proposed a solution to monitor the ship's traffic before, during, and after the pandemic. Uh, we focus on the European ports, straits, and coastal cities to see how the activities are affected and how they are restarted and to which level the influence are rich. And another motivation is like uh, the ocean plays a vital role in supporting sustainable agendas or reinforcing uh, enforcing regulations. So as pointed in a workshop on ocean science, the defined protected areas in Europe countries are uh, seldomly monitored or the, the, pol the police cannot enforce them. And I think it's, it's because of the size of the ocean. Um, it's, it's so vast that the monitoring work is beyond any scope of uh, agency or regulators. So we cannot ask the COPE to monitor every square kilometers of the ocean and try to, uh, to find out the illegal activities there. So using the public accessible satellite and algorithms, this will allow the, the regulators, institutions, or even nonprofits to monitor and raise attention and to protect the ocean. So how it works, the diagram shows that uh, how it works at the inference time. So uh, we, we skip the training time for now. Uh, we will look at the inference time. So just, uh, uh, just uh, take it as granted that we have a pre-trained model. And you want to, we want to know the ship's traffic density in a certain location within a time window. So the input parameter will be the latitude and longitude of the location and the radius in meter. Then we will search for images that fully covers the square, which inscribe the circle. And the search query will, will be passed using uh, any satellite, uh, any S2 API. In our case, will be Sentinel Hub. Uh, but if you have uh, other APIs like uh, Sentinel Set, it can you, you can also use that. It does not uh, fully um, kind of attach to the Eurodata Cube, the platform that we use. So you can pre-select the images with less cloud, or uh, no empty pixels which is available on the, on the EDC. Um, remember the relative easy way that I mentioned, so the business class. Uh, we choose only the image that contains 30% or even less cloud to make sure there's not too much noise in the images. And we also uh, select images with even less cloud. We can also select with even less cloud, but then we'll get very little timestamps available there. So we stay at 30%. And for each location, we will perform an operation called temporary fusion, temporal fusion to get a background image. And I'll talk about this operator later. So the background image is cloud-free and boat-free. And it contains only the static object like port infrastructures, buildings, or land. After we obtain the background image, we will pair, pair it with, the, with each timestamps um, uh, as the input parameter 
as an input image for the model. And the output of the model will be uh, the ship's count as well as the heat map where the map uh, where he, the model thinks the, the ship will be. So after you get the indicator, it can be used to generate alert for authorities like there are ships, X ships near protected areas and there might be some illegal activities happening there. So as a summary, uh, if you want to know the ship's traffic in a certain area of interest within a time window, our solution will give you a density map and a ship count by using uh, the input parameters. And the background image is just a byproduct. And it's worth to mention that the density map is, uh, has lower resolution compared to the original image. So in, in our case, it's 10 times lower. So the S2 image has one, uh, like 10 meters per pixel. So the density map itself is like 100 meter per pixel. Uh, so from here, I will go through uh, the training steps from data downloading, annotation, and the model architecture and so on. So let's look at how we download the data and how do we did the annotation. Um, so the oceans and seas are very vast. So if we search randomly on the ocean in European water body, then probably we cannot find ship at all. So that's why we try to focus on the, um, um, the images that, that is near the ports, straits, and where the tra ship's traffic concentrate. And it's very easy to track. So you can think the satellite takes samples over these locations. And these samples will give us a reasonable estimation of ship tra ship's traffic on the ocean as a, in general. And you can also think that the one ship will eventually start or end its trip in, in a port. And for each location, we search images in a time window. And then we've got multiple images with different timestamps. We download only the near infra and green bands uh, out of the all bands uh, of S2. And the cloud mask is provided by Sentinel 2's uh, service, which is which I think is S2 cloudless. We will filter out the image that uh, covers uh, that is over 30% cloud to make sure that the original image is less noisy. And we also select the image with less, uh, like, we also select the image that is only uh, fully covered with, with pixel. So there's no emptiness in the image. Um, Michael and I annotated manually after we download the image. Um, so when we label the image, we plotted. Uh, all the images of one location, only the near infrared band, and use the color map called Cool Warm to plot the false color instead. Uh, so this will make the ship more visible when displayed. So the temporal fusion step, I will talk more about, uh, about it on this slide. So how we, do we get the background image? So this is in, inspired by the fact that the ship are moving objects and they're not constantly present in the image of one location. The so use temporal fusion will get a background image that is totally uh, static, contains only the static object. And the step was inspired by our long existing index called normalized difference water index. And this index is used to, uh, to detect water bodies in satellite imagery. And it is calculated using the, uh, the green and near infrared band of the, the image. So after we have this index image, we will just take uh, the maximum um, of um, over maximum over all the timestamps of this index, and then we have the background image. So finally, we need to uh, bring the background image and the near infrared image to the same range so that we can fit it into the the model and train it. Um, and the label we collected is only a ship count, which is a number. So we don't have any mask image or any bunny boxes. And we named dataset uh, ships 2K since it contains around about 2000 images in it. And each image in a dataset is uh, one square kilometer, which is 100, 100 pixel by 100 pixel. Um, so when we label it, we use the tool called Superintendent, which is developed by, developed by a former colleague of us. Uh, so it enables you to label image directly on Drupal, uh, Drupal notebook. 
So it's a very easy to use. It's a very, it's a tool that is easy to use and quite handy. You don't have to install a lot of uh, heavy infrastructure. Uh, so if you compare uh, the ships 2K with any other data set uh, that is uh, quite popular on the on the community, you can see it's a very uh, very small and weakly supervised due to the fact that we don't have any mask images. So here are more statistics about the data set. I think we I still have 10 minutes maybe. Um, so I will not go into too details of the statistics. So we divided, uh, what's to mention is like, we divided the locations into train and test to make sure that um, the locations in test data set is not seen um, when the model is trained. <clears throat> so let's look at the architecture of the, the model itself. So the input of this model is a near infrared image and the background image. So we defined a Latin space that, I think the st intermediate step is not really important. And I think it's quite straightforward. And so the important thing is the Latin space that, that we defined. And this is the probability density map for a ship count in a subregion R that equals to K. So in our case, we divided the image into a 10 by 10 grid. So the height and width of the, this Latin space that is 10 by 10. So I illustrate by uh, dividing uh, an image by four. So this is only for illustration. So each pixel in, um, in the Z corresponds to one subregion in the image. And the Nmax is the maximum number of ships in the subregion. Uh, and the range of K then will be between zero and Nmax. Therefore, the depth of that will be Nmax plus one. And so each channel of Z will correspond to one K um, in, uh, in a definition. So since Sentinel-2's image resolution is 10 meters per pixel, and uh, this subregion, by definition, will be uh, corresponding to, to um, a 100 meter by 100 meter area. And since it's a quite small area and the ships we, that we track is quite big, so we assume that the Nmax, which is the maximum uh, ship count in a subregion, uh, to be one. I think that's a quite, uh, quite, quite reasonable assumption. Uh, therefore, you will see the diagram uh, in the diagram that the Latin space that has only two channels. So from the Latin space that with the equation four and five, we will calculate the probability density map uh, capital P for the ship's presence. And Y is the, uh, uh, which is the expected value. So in our assumption, P equals to Y because we take, because we take the M max equals to one and the maximum over capital P, we will get a P hat, which means, uh, which is the probability of the ship's presence uh, when the traffic density is the highest among all the subregions. And again, because our assumption is M max equals to one. So the, the P, we can get the P from the, the ground truth Y. So the ground truth Y is the ship's account. So as long as the ship's count is larger than zero, we can see that we can get the probability uh, P, which is, uh, which is quite like, it, this is nice assumption, we can, we can use it uh, to get the P. And I think Y hat is quite straightforward because Y is the expected value of a uh, ship count of, of all subregions. So if you do a summation, you will get the ship count of the of this whole area, which is the um, which is then the corresponding part of the, the predicted value corresponding to the, the ground truth. So you can think the upper branch as a classification problem to check if there is a ship presence in the image. And the lower branch is a regression branch to try to predict the ship count. So the upper branch, we use the binary cross entropy loss. And for the regression branch, we use uh, a loss called smooth L1, which is also known as Huber loss. Um, I think the reason is it's less sensitive to outliers compared to the MSE loss, for example. And our final loss function is the term of this too. Um, try to, uh, with a learnable variable. For the first term, we'll encourage network to detect the boats with high probability in subregions where boats are present and otherwise it has no boats. 
the second term will encourage the network to update embeddings for all sub regions simultaneously. So number of parameters, uh, yeah. So I forgot to mention that it's a shallow neural network. So you can see the architecture is quite simple. Um, and if you compare the number of parameters with any other popular architectures nowadays, it's very light and D. I think it's very important uh, to work on open data. And the, the philosophy is that we want to empower everybody to, um, to, uh, to reproduce the, the results that we can, uh, that, we, that we trained and also can use this architecture to do their own work instead of uh, limiting the computing results to only companies like Facebook or Google. So it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite lean but yet powerful. The most of the image has no shapes in it. And I think that's it's quite common. Um, we Therefore, we try to group the output with, uh, with ship and without ship and calculate the precision recall as well as F1 score and treat it as a classification problem. And the regression problem, however, we will use the MAE as a metric. And because as you can see on the, on the graph, on the graph that, that on test data set, the model performs better when the ship density is very low. And this is because that our assumption is that in, sub in each subregion, we assume that that's only maximum one ship in, uh, in there. So I think uh, if, the, uh, if the picture follows this assumption, uh, the model will perform good, otherwise not. And the graph shows the predicted count and the ground truth on training and test data set. So ideally, we will, so, we will see all dots uh, or stay close, uh, stays on the line or stay closely on the line, which means they are equal and the error is quite small. So we considered also using different bands of S2. Uh, we tried to use RGB uh, and, and near infra and to learn and detect the ship. And I think it's because the ship is a warm object compared to the cooler water. So a further uh, ablation study shows that the background image has, so we compare the performance of all metrics without uh, pairing the background image and with the background image. So you see the in the table that uh, the background image helps. So in, a, in the inference time, we applied training, uh, the train model on a larger area um, which is nine square kilometers. And here are some results. So the upper, the upper pictures are, I think the near infra band of the locations and the lower ones are the density map that is generated. So the darker the dot is, the higher the probability uh, of a ship's presence it will be. So the next slide, there are more examples of even larger AIO. So here, um, I think the heat map was printed in a different color map. That's why you will see uh, the black, uh, the, the blue background instead of uh, a white background in the previous slide. Uh, right. So, okay, failures. Uh, the model fails on some particular locations. And of course it will fail uh, in some cases, corner cases. When the traffic is dense, as I said, since our model assumes that uh, in each subregion there'll be one uh, ship uh, that is available there, uh, that is present. So uh, if the ship's density is very high, then it violates this assumption and the model will underestimate the count. And if the ship itself is too long, it looks like multiple ships on the image. And sometimes it also happens that the ships travels very fast, leaving a very long tail on the water. So the model will treat those as multiple ships as well. Um, so from our experiment, if the model works and it works very well, but when there's some noise like cloud or wave, or because of the, the angle of the, the sound is uh, off Nadia, 
which means the angle, the, the angle that the sunlight reaches the water is long, uh, is large, then it will probably fail very much. So uh, in locations in Northern Europe in particular, we see that model performs bad. Uh, one reason is because Northern Europe is very cloudy. And second is the, uh, the latitude is high, which means um, the sunlight reaches the water in the very large angle. And I think if you apply this algorithm on the countries like Ethiopia and Equator, it will probably uh, perform uh, much better compared to Northern Europe. And there are several ways to tackle this. We could remove the outliers and to make the model or weather a cloud aware by adding like weather information or cloud mask. Uh, this means we need to introduce the other data to the data set. And another possible way is to introduce human in the loop after the model gives the prediction. And I think that will be a reasonable, um, a reasonable solution if you want to use the model uh, in production. So uh, for the inference time, we choose the list of ports and strays in Europe. And we try to cover as much as many countries as uh, as possible. So we choose twenty one uh, large AIOs, and they are from nineteen countries out of twenty seven countries of EU. And we selected those areas to illustrate the impact of COVID nineteen um, on the ship related activities and in different kinds of uh, European water bodies. And we categorize the types of the uh, the water bodies into like commerce, uh, tourism, and fisheries. So in the list, um, we compare the traffic changes in winter and the spring of, two, of 2020 and 2019. So almost all locations, as you see, the traffic declined, um, especially in spring 2020, when the Europe went, to, went into lockdown and we will see a large drop in the ship's traffic. So the locations that were hit hard by COVID most is the tourism locations. The next slide, we have some traffic uh, of some locations each month. Uh, yeah, so here we go. So we have selected some of the locations and compare the traffic between two years. So the X axis of this graph is the month and the Y axis is the number of ships the model predicted of each location. And we averaged uh, over month. So the dashed line represents the traffic in 2019 and the real line represents the traffic in 2020. So we can see that tourism was hit hard and it recovers very slow. However, the fishery activities recovered fast. Commerce, cargo, they are not affected, uh, which is quite interesting. So after the phase one of this contest, um, we need to prove that the solution is upscalable and we can apply it to uh, the whole EU. So we designed the following workflow uh, for the frequent update and fast inference. The background image comes uh, from the temporal fusion and it requires multiple timestamps. And so we will calculate them offline in advance and update it regularly using uh, fresh images to capture any static object changes uh, on the land. And we plan the inference to be weekly. So every week uh, we will query uh, newly ingested S2 images and paired with the background image for inference. Uh, from time to time, we can select the images on uh, which the model failed badly and add them to the data set and retrain the model. So it's kind of like an active learning loop. Um, after we obtain a better model, we could push it to production. And the output will be displayed on the dashboard uh, in two ways. So the first way is the indicator, which is the ship's count um, changing monthly. And also we plan to display the, uh, the heat map on the uh, on an interactive map, on an interactive map as a, a layer. So we, as I said, we won only the third prize of this contest. Um, we are uh, we are not invited to integrate the um, to integrate our work to race, which is a shame. And I think uh, even we are quite happy about the re this result. There are several reasons why it is so. So I think the the race is not mature by the time that we participate the uh, the contest. And there's a lot of uh, formats that is not supported by race. And we didn't know that uh, until the last minute. And also I think the communication with ESA as well as the third party companies is not very efficient because uh, ESA is not only uh, 
is not the only organizer, but uh, since the platforms are supported by a lot of third party companies, and you can only send them emails to ask technical questions. Uh, that generates a lot of delay. And at the end, we discover that what, what we need to do to bring it to a uh, to race. So we are running out of time at the end. Um, so I think that's the, the reason that why you cannot see this work published on race. So the performance of this model, um, since the whole project is based on EDC, um, if you need to, if you need to reproduce everything uh, on EDC, you need the GPU access and the GPU plan or workspace uh, on the EDC. And you also need the access to use a Sentinel Hub API. So for development, you need uh, the web process service, which is offered on EDC to run uh, scripts in the background. But as I mentioned that the algorithm itself, it does not uh, attach to this platform. So if you can process the data by your own, you can totally do it uh, without EDC. Since our model is quite simple and the amount of parameters is also small. So training requires very little resource compared to any other uh, like deep learning models nowadays. So therefore the inference is also fast, uh, even if the model is not quantized. Okay, so the last, the last two slides, I still have some examples of the heat maps and locations. I think the, the left one is the near infra band, and the middle one is the background image that is generated, and the right one is the heat map. I think the color map is slightly different compared to what I displayed before but I, I don't necessarily remember which color map it is, but I assume it's cool warm. Um, yeah, so again, another example. So the, con uh, the context is continued this year. So I think the pandemic, the pandemic is not over. So ESA launched the new contest again. So if you guys are interested in satellite projects, it will be a great opportunity to work on it because you will offer the free access to images and APIs and it's really easy to, to start with. So um, I followed them on LinkedIn. So I see uh, one topic this year is about Africa. So they're trying to uh, monitor the, uh, the urban growth in Africa and it will be probably start late, uh, late this month. So yeah, if you guys are interested in just follow them on Twitter or on, on LinkedIn and you will get the latest information. Okay, so that, that's all about my talk. All right, thank you so much, Tito. Uh, it was very much um, interesting, um, specifically like the people are working on a, on a satellite image race here. So mm -hmm. that is an interesting fact, like you, you've shared like your experience and um, you know, different um, and upcoming challenges as well. So that I think, the, the advantage of, you know, this charting side, like you can get, I know, this interesting data for free. So mm -hmm. um, you can drive them in, you know, implement them in any way, yeah. you, specifically in Ethiopia, because we don't have our own satellites. So get this data right. very much expensive, as, as you might have known. Mm -hmm. so, um, I think for the next um, 10 minutes or like, let's say five minutes, uh, we might, we, we accept questions from the, from the participants. So... If you, if you guys have a question, just um, either you raise your hands or you can send it in, in a chat. Okay. So Samuel, if he raised his hand. Um, okay, so yeah, Samuel, you can ask a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, I, I think uh, I want to ask about how uh, you, you, have, you haven't included any cloud uh, in your data set and you said that you can add uh, a new data set to your existing is, is that possible uh, because uh, i'm i'm not actually working on this satellite imagery yeah. but if, uh, we can, so, mm -hmm. if, if, if we can add 
additional things in our existing data sets, that would be nice. Uh, yes. In what way? Okay. I want to yes. Know. So I think your question is like, if you can add uh, additional data to uh, an open data set. So is that your question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So normally you can do that. Uh, in a pure research way, I think you can do that. But sometimes the open data set has uh, a data license, which uh, which does not allows you to mix any data uh, with any data, any other data set. So, like uh, I think Israel is pretty aware of that. When we participate the the uh, the ESAS uh, Prova V challenge, the restricted the the, pro the prohibits to add any extra data set. Right. So, but this this contest particular, you can use uh, mix anything. Depends on the data license. That is interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think there is another question. Uh, probably, um, uh, can you read it? Like, or uh, should I read it like out loud? Yeah, uh, I, I just saw that other thing difficult in acquisition spatial detection. What makes object detection? detection from satellite other than um i think i think it's it's pretty similar it's pretty similar to what i see in uh, medical imaging for example because the object in some satellite is quite small mm. and let's say if you have 10 meters per pixel and you want to detect a building that's almost uh, impossible but if you have like higher resolution i think that will be much better and sometimes the object is very tiny and makes uh, it's challenging to detect. It's pretty similar to the like uh, what I have read in a paper about the, the medical imaging. It's like the cancer, breast cancer or something. Mm -hmm. So the object itself is very tiny. So in, in that sense, it's it's have some similarities. And also uh, sometimes you want to combine images from different resolutions. So that will give you uh, kind of not the uniform data set. So that will be quite difficult as well in a uh, in an image processing perspective instead of uh, just purely object detection from uh, a pure image that's great um do we have another question so i think um if if, if people are still processing questions like let me ask you one thing so most of the time when i talk about when i think about um this you know satellite imagery or other i would say like you know kind of fancy deep learning things so always specifically in Ethiopia case, um, I always think about, you know, we have in a very limited you know, resources in, in terms of com computing power and also like, you know, even mm -hmm. so, um, so is there any, you know, preterm model available or is the, is the work is, you know, open source so people can, you know, adapt things up? I think in terms of pre trained model, uh, as far as I remember at the time at Element AI, Especially when we worked on the the probability challenge, mm -hmm. uh, we we removed the pre-trained model on purpose because we want to protect this algorithm from being abused by bad guys. I think that's yeah, that's yeah, the I motivation. Remember, I remember. I remember that. Yeah. Thing. I remember that. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think <laughs> a lot of people have been asking on the on the on the GitHub. Like people are like asking, "Oh, do we have any exactly model?" But yeah, exactly. Always yeah. has satellite imagers are like, you know, we can use it as a good thing, let's say in Ethiopia, case because we don't have any satellites. So in the beginning, yeah. high res images are expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but specifically, let's say if there are any collaborations or, you know, partnerships that are available between you know, AIC is in a big, um, a big, big um, minister. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, is it, can, can it be available on demand? I think, let me um, rephrase my question. Yeah, I think I think it's possible. So you can do a lot of things with open data already. Right. Especially especially the ESA Sentinels, and mm. also uh, there's also one called Landsat, which is from US, I guess. So you can already achieve a lot of things using the open data. Mm. And for particular smaller areas, um, well, as as a, on a national level, you probably will get a discount uh, as a research institute from uh, Maxa, for example, uh, it's quite different uh, from the commercial plan. So commercial plan, they charge a lot, but if your uh, purpose is using for research and you can probably get a very good deal, uh, especially if you negotiate that plan with, with Maxa, uh, for example, or Planet um, on the national level. I, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of, there's a lot of rooms for there. 
And actually at LMNAI, I, I did a project using the high resolution imagery. And we partnered with the a very uh, like, like I'm not, I will not say powerful, but a governmental uh, institute. And actually the governmental institute, they get free images from Maxa every year. So if you partner with them, you, you will get some access to it. All right, great. So I think um, uh, it, it will be interesting, like if, if we see, you know, AIC or any, any research um, centers can, um, you know, participate in this um, type of competitions. So that like, it will be good for the country uh, as well as like, you know, for the institute as well. So probably, yeah. I think uh, as far as I know, Jichao is like, she's, she's open to probably, you know, working close if, if I'm not, um, if I'm not mistaken. So you guys, yeah, yeah. yeah so just propose something then she'll be in touch, huh? Yeah, so the, the contest actually had some prize. So we won the third prize, which is 3,000 euro at the end. And the first winner got like 10,000 euro. So yeah. Did, did, did you still like, did you still plan the trees? That's what I, I think we, we're doing this for the Prober V challenge. Or are you use it for personal use? The money is just, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how Freddie uh, did that with the money at the end. <laughs> so we, I divided the price with Michael and we didn't spend anything on trees. But uh, I think Michael spent on, on AWS subscriptions or somewhere, like used for some other projects. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So yeah, you guys um, can participate in the competitions and win the money. Yeah, so as <laughs> It would be nice, like if you. I think you can share this slide so the this the the, the Zoom is recorded. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I will send the the slides afterwards to yeah. Israel. So Israel can redistribute to you guys. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you, thank you so much, Dita. It was very nice yeah. talk. So I think yeah. I'm a lot of uh, pleasure. Yeah, a lot of researchers here, like you know, got something from it, and uh, I would say nothing to drop as well. So yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. It's a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Thank bye you bye. so much. Have a thank nice you. day. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.